It is my pleasure to introduce Jesse Thornburg from Temple University. Uh, Jesse is one of three who run a podcast, the uh, Geology Flannelcast, the premier Pennsylvania geology podcast. Uh, <laughs> ten years now. You guys have been doing that for ten years. That's amazing. And it's and, and if you guys haven't checked it out, uh, you need to. It's it's really cool. Uh, so the the genesis of this presentation, this adventure that we're going to go on was actually from GSA in Pittsburgh, the National GSA meeting in Pittsburgh. Uh, Jesse gave a similar talk and it was awesome. And then he's he's going down an escalator at the conference. And I, I ran up to him. I said, Jesse, you need to give this presentation to Hags. And he says, OK, don't hurt me. So that's why he's here. Oh. Yes. Threatening violence. That's how I'm going to get speakers. <laughs> All right. So let me get some things set up here. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Jesse. I need to share my screen. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll try and... I'm, I'm not known for brevity, but I'll, I'll try and get us out of here by 7.30. But if not, you know, we'll see what we can do. Um, so hello, welcome. Thanks for making me an honorary hag. I, I appreciate it. It was took some um, there, there was some explanation when I my wife saw it on our shared calendar. She's like, what is this uh, meeting? Or what is this hags about? And I was like, eh, it's fine. It's geology. She's like, all right, uh, sure. So anyhow, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Ordovician um, as a whole and uh, sort of thinking about ancient landscapes uh, to a certain extent in the Ordovician and focus a lot of our, our time here on, on, on this singular outcrop that uh, haunts me a, a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the work that that, that I've done up there with others. I'm going to give them all the credit. Um, I've, uh, students students that have done some work up here as well. And I just want to tell you right now, I've got no answers. There's there's going to be no resolution at the end of this. So I'm going to set the bar really low um, in terms of you know what you're going to come away with. Um, so the Ordovician, right? It, in um, there we go. So the Ordovician, uh, you know, 450 million years ago, roughly, is 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 we're getting into the late Ordovician. We're going to be a little bit after that, um, at like 445 ish. Uh, but we're, we're coming at tail end of the Taconic orogeny. So we have all of these sediments shedding down. The red dot is going to be basically where we're at. Um, so these are sort of the two best maps I could find, um, and then showing where we go into the Silurian here, give just to sort of orient ourselves as, as we come into the Acadian orogeny as well. The thing about the Ordovician is that, the late Ordovician especially, is that we're going into an ice house world and that, that sort of plays a, a really big role here because the Ordovician is marked by this massive extinction event. It's the second largest you know, as we define extinction events, um, second only to the Permian. But you know, as I as I was reading about this, so like we get focused a lot of times, right? When when we're we're looking at rocks, and we sort of lose ourselves. And I've looked at the Juniata Formation now for for a number of years, and I realized I only had sort of a, a very basic view of the Ordovician. I, like I knew the extinction, and I knew the the ice house, you know, coming out of a greenhouse into an ice house, and then going back into the greenhouse of the Silurian. And sort of thought about how that would affect our location. But I never really thought too deeply about about the Ordovician as a whole, and um, which you know that's partially on me. Um, but I didn't realize the Ordovician actually starts with this huge biodiversification event. Like we we often think the Cambrian explosion is the big one, right? Where we're getting this radiation of life, and sure the Cambrian is where we find a lot of the the phyla that that that, that we start to see. You know, this big radiation of all these complex multicellular life, but it's actually overtaken by the Ordovician uh, at the start of the Ordovician event. 
and it's because you start getting uh, much more oxygen into, at least that's sort of the idea, you get more, much more oxygen into the ocean, and that's gonna sort of play a part of the story here. But as we get into the late, late Ordovician, so it's like all well and good, oh man, we're doing great, nothing ever is gonna go wrong, and then sure enough, as we get to the end of the Ordovician, uh, everything starts dying off. And, and in the beginning, the idea is that like, it's, it's because um, you're getting this, this growth of these ice sheets. And part of it is because you have Gondwana over, over, over the, the South Pole. And so sea levels are drawing down, shelves are becoming emergent. Everything on the shelves that, that is adapted to life starts dying off. Most of, you know, a lot of the major trilobites at the time, including my favorite here, uh, little Agnostia dies off, goes extinct. You get some other things that that start sprouting up. These Eurypterids, which you know, these are nightmarish. That's that's two to three meters tall. Oh, no thanks. Stay out of that water. Um, but the the interesting thing about the Ordovician extinction event is it's actually sort of like two pulses. And so the, you you have this anoxia that starts to set in as your sea level drops. You know, deep marine stuff, the circulation dies off and it, it becomes anoxic. And so it's causing a lot of the die off there. But but the stuff that does survive actually starts to thrive until uh, you start coming out of the ice house, things start warming, and it actually creates uh, some unixic conditions. So you get the, the, the sulfitic anoxic conditions that then just kills off all the stuff that did manage to survive. So it's sort of like this one-two punch that kills off, you know, 40 to 80 percent of, of of the species at the time, and you can see the big the two drops here. So it's it, it's it's a really interesting time, and and I think that that's part of this story, um, you know, in terms of when we're picturing ourselves. So I have to visualize it, and that's that's how I I, I approach outcrops, right? Or when I'm trying to like make my observations, and then later on piece it together, I'm like. I'm trying to visualize it. And I think this plays a big part of the story is thinking about, oh, what is, what is the world like at this time, right? You know, what is going on here? And so that's, that's where we're at. So that's sort of setting the scene because as we get into the late Ordovician here is when we, we get to, you know, the main character or the main villain, depending on, on how you view the, the Juniata formation. And I, I go back and forth on it, right? Um, every time I'm there, I come away thinking something different or I'm just frustrated and sad. And so, you know, as we're, as we're thinking about it, this is where we're gonna be. I, if, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with it, it, it is an incredible outcrop. It's beautiful sort of stratigraphy. It's it's one of these classic outcrops. The Juniata itself is one of the the classic uh, formations in the Valley and Ridge, um, and you can find it all the way down into Virginia and West Virginia and Tennessee. You can find it uh, up and down here in the Valley and Ridge, and it's equivalent as you go west. It, you get the Queenston, um, and we're going to see that you know the it's it's going to be this this grayish red mudstone sandstone. Um, at the base, there are some conglomerates, uh, which are which are sort of interesting, but not really part of our story today. But it is sort of something to to think about, and it's so it's it's likely deposited. Well, I'm not going to tell you where it's deposited because that's part of the story. Here is is the environmental deposition. But if we're orienting ourselves stratigraphically, it's underlain by the bald eagle, overlain by the by the by the Tuscarora. Um, you know, so it's it is, you know, sort of the classic formation. You can see this. This is the the, the column here from the correlation chart uh, showing this part of central Pennsylvania. You know, it, it it was a it was a the outcrop is so nice, especially for students, because you know I so I did my undergrad at Penn State, and I think we went to the South Crop a number of times, which I had completely forgotten about. It has, has until I went back there more recently. But one of the things about the Juniata is, is trying to figure out what its depositional environment is, right? And so uh, 
there's been some work on on the paleo flow here, you know, showing you're getting this the the wash of sediment coming in from from the from the taconic, you know, from the from the south and the east. And so we're trying to figure out our our position on our landscape here. And we can think about that contextually. We've got these two cross sections here uh, to to show you, you know, uh, that were done previously. You know, uh, one is in the northern part, and the other is in the southern part of the state. And it, I one just love this because cross sections are just beautiful. Oh gosh, I just but I, I like sedimentology and strateg stratigraphy, right? So I just I, I'll take every cross section I can get my hands on. But I really like this because it, it really highlights the Juniata, right? So the Juniata is at the top here in the red. And so you can see the darker the red, the more sandy it is. And so you can see in the southern part, you have these, the, the, these thicker sands. And in, in the northern part, it's a little bit more silty, um, a little bit more uh, argillaceous. So you have, you know, maybe lower energy coming in, you know, the higher energy in the south and the east from all of this st uh, uh, sediment from, from the Taconic. We're just going to sort of keep this in mind. And then as you go out west, you're getting into the basin, right? So, so we're in the Taconic Foreland Basin here. So that's why we're shedding all of this sediment. So that takes us to this outcrop. And so this outcrop outside Potter's Mills, which is south of State College, if you need to orient yourself, like I said, is 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 a fantastic outcrop. And so I found myself here. So my my one of my co-hosts on the on the podcast and 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 one of my my colleagues, Chris Seminak at the time, was doing his grad work down at George Mason. And he was he was on a trip with Rick Diccio and they were looking at Juniata stuff in Virginia and West Virginia. And he told Chris, he's like, oh, there's a great outcrop at Potter's Mills you should look at um, because it is sort of a classic Juniata uh, outcrop. And he called me up and he's like, hey, we need to go look at this outcrop. We need to go look at these rocks. And I said, say no more. Like someone says, let's go look at rocks. You don't, but you just get in the car and you're gone. And so we we go up there and that's when I start saying, why, why are we, what's the purpose here? And he's like, it's, it's this marginal Marine. It's a transitional environment. We should figure out where we're at. And he's a coastal geomorphologist. So he's the whole time up. He's like, I bet it's a barrier Island. It's probably a barrier Island. And in my mind, I'm like, it's not a barrier Island, uh, but he sees them everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a barrier island, I'll say. Uh, so we get there and I'm like, this is all very familiar to me. I feel like I've been here before. And like I mentioned earlier, I, I had been there before. Um, you know, we've taken many field trips as an undergrad, but like a good undergrad, I, I instantly forgot it all. Um, and so uh, we, we get there and instantly we're, we're just struck by like, the, the features within the, this sow crop um, are, are pretty fantastic, but but the the main thing and, and sort of the, the 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 big sort of controversy about this outcrop are going to be these these features, which which we'll call burrows. And what type of burrows is sort of the 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 question. And as we went there, we, we went there in, in, in 2015, 2016, it was right after two big papers came out looking at these boroughs and, and looking at trying to figure out what they were, what they were saying. So this first paper came out by, by Greg Retallick in the early 2000s, and he had been out at, both these papers are at Potter's Mills too, they're not just Juniata in general, it's, it's Potter's Mills. And he said these boroughs, so Greg Retallick is a is a paleopedologist. He does paleosols, terrestrial environments, and so he sees this outcrop of these alternating sands and, and siltstones, and he's like, these are paleosols, which makes this terrestrial, which makes the burrows terrestrial. And he goes ahead and he identifies them and names them: Scoinia birbauri. Uh, birbauri is na is named in honor of Dick Birbauer from Binghamton, who. Uh, Help develop the concepts of allocyclic and autocyclic controls on on deposition. Just if if you know your sedimentology, 
So that was kind of, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. But anyway, so he's saying these are sort of like millipedes, which is, is it, was, it was a big deal at the time because this moves back millipedes on land significantly. And so it, he, he was saying he's basing it on sort of this evidence that he's seeing in the sedimentology and the paleosols. And he also did some, some, some geochemistry to, to say it's suggestive of a non-marine environment. Uh, fast forward about 10 years, uh, Davies and others come along and say, well, not so fast. And they say the deposition is probably marginal marine. And that's, that's what most workers have, have, have assigned to the junia in general, right? So we're on this sort of marginal marine environment um, you know, maybe tidally dominated environment. And, and that's, they assign some facies uh, associations here to say like, oh, these features are suggestive of, of this sort of transitional. They're arguing that bur the burrows and the paleosols don't necessarily make it a terrestrial setting. N not sure I necessarily agree with that reasoning, especially the, the paleosols. You do sort of find paleosols in, 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 you know, some some transitional settings, but yeah, not really. Um, a lot of my prior research is in paleosols too. That's how I got brought into this. Um, but but they're making these these suggestions that, you know, it's based on the, their their interpretation of, of the facies relationship. And they did a lot with thinking about the transition to the Tuscarora and saying, no, it's, it, this, is, this is marginal marine. Which makes which makes the burrows scolithos, just sort of these these trace fossils that you would find in the marginal marine setting. Because one of the things that they look at it and they say is that the burrows, if they are scoinia, you know, as Ritalik said, it, they predate any other scoinia by 150 million years. Which okay, yeah, that's a long time, without finding any other ones. But terrestrial infaunal bioturbation, you know, little in, invertebrates on land. You know, you find them in into the into the Silurian, so that's you know it's it's not that 23 million years, but it's not that it's not that crazy. And so, in my mind, they're both making good arguments, but they're not making conclusive arguments, right? None of these, they're all sort of there, there's a little speculation on both parts, which you know we do a lot. If, if it was if it was definitive, I wouldn't be up here talking about either one. And so it, it sort of left an open question, and that that's why we started looking at these. And we, you know, as you do, we we went out there and we said, "Well, let's see what we see, and let's see what we think." You know, I guess that's the heart of science, or or maybe hubris. Um, so we went out, a, a bunch of us, myself, Chris Seminac, Chris Ost, went out, and and in 2016, put together. You know this measure section. I well, I said we. I wasn't part of it. Chris Seminac Chrysos did did the bulk of this measured section work. Um, I was I was busy. My wife was having a, a child, and I I only mentioned once and only once if I could go on this trip, and she looked at me, and that's all. And I so I wasn't on this trip. Uh, so. Yeah, we we measured they measured these sections, and this is what we had seen prior. We had seen some really interesting features, right? So you have cross bedding, but you also you also see features indicative of of maybe some tidal influence, you know, wavy bedding. But you see these trace fossils sort of everywhere, and it is it's a fantastic sight. And so I I I said, all right, you know, we put together the, this for GSA in, in 2016. Um, thinking about the, the the sedimentology that we had we had seen up there, trying to see if we could replicate either Ritalik or Davies measured section, and we you know fell somewhere in the middle. And at the time, we said, all right, you know why not both? You know why not marine near the bottom becoming more fluvial influence near the top? You find paleosols at the top, and you find sort of sort of the the, the tidal stuff you know, lower in the section. At the time, there was a lot of covered covered section there. I don't know if you've been to this part of the world recently, but in, in the last couple of years, PennDOT has come through and sort of <clears throat> re, redone everything. The whole road is, is, is reworked. That whole section up into going up into State College is being 
just overhauled. But they came in, they actually got, I'm actually kicking myself thinking about it. They, there used to be a whole median of, of rock and outcrop and they just wiped it all out before we got a chance to go in and, and sort of measure it out and take samples. But it, again, you know, I think that's that's more of the problem being a geologist, right? You can just need more samples, just more, more, more. And then the next thing you know, your garage is filled and getting, <laughs> getting yelled at. Um, so, so unfortunately we didn't get to, but they, they cleared off, they put a turning lane in now coming out of the campground that's right, right, right below the, the outcrop. And so this covered section, is, a lot of it's not covered anymore. So we, we actually need to go back and redo the, the measured section, just throwing that one out there for, for the summer. We need to, uh, the, I was, we were out there last summer and I said to myself, I can't keep coming here. I can't keep doing this to myself. And then I started putting this together and I said, oh, I need to go back and do more. There's, there's more that needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> so it is, it is, it is, uh, you know, the siren song of the Juniata is calling and as summer approaches. So we need to remeasure this to really sort of nail down some things. But the thing this outcrop is really good for is, is for students to get out there. And, and I love taking uh, uh, students out there because not only is the stratigraphy great, you can see the beds and, and you can measure the beds and the beds change, there's sandstones, but they have features within them. And, you know, every bed they look at, they have something new to sort of look at. You gotta, you gotta get them engaged and and you know later on they can look at you know the, the stratigraphy that's a little more boring uh and they can find interest in it but when they start out you got to give them got to give them sort of the interesting stuff so you, you look at all of this convolute bedding or these crazy crazy trace fossils and so I've, I've been lucky to have a few really good students that that on their own have sort of done, done some studies out here and and the one was uh i had a student augusta who who put together, she did some point counting. She collected all of these samples. I wanna say she did like 21 or 22 thin sections, collecting samples from those units that we had measured, did some point counting. She actually did some geochemistry on it as well to try and figure out, oh, is there any change in, in maybe the, the, the sediment source, where we're bringing sediment in or, or how the sediment um, that we're seeing deposited, you know, just from, from a, from a looking at it from a provenance sort of point of view. And, and there's there's not too much, there's a little bit as you get into unit five and six, there seems to be this subtle shift in, in, the, in, in the sediment source. And one of the questions, you know, how real is it? Is it all just recycled material that's just being reworked within the system or not? But it is something sort of interesting. And that I think that's part of the story, right? You get out there and you start looking at these things and and they lead to more questions and they lead to more questions and when does it stop and i don't know if it ever does stop you know I, we'll, we'll never have all the answers but i i do think it's 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 just a fantastic site but so augusta put this together she actually presented the pcpg poster conference a couple of years ago too did a lot of really great work looking at this and so you know i i want to want to highlight what she did um and then i had another student ted who uh, was did his undergrad at Temple, did his master's at Temple as well, and, and now is I think at grad school at Brown. But he um, he and during his master's came to me and said, "Remember that outcrop we went to?" Because he was in my undergrad sedimentary geology class, and he said, uh, he, "He said I said what outcrop are you talking about?" He's like the one with the red rocks, and I go. We're in southeastern Pennsylvania. There's a lot of red rocks. <laughs> We've been to a lot of red rocks. He's like, no, the one that it took us forever to drive to. I was like, oh, Potter's Mills. It's three hours from, from Temple. And he's like, remember the paleosols out there? And I was like, boy, do I ever. He's like, what can we do with those paleosols? And I was like, well, you can actually go look at them. You know, because we hadn't we haven't done like a comprehensive look at the paleosols, trying to to profile them in sort of detail. We measure them out. We map them out sort of at a surface level. Um, and he's like, i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm gonna look at them in detail. And you know, he, he had a lot of vim and vigor, and he did some pretty good work. He didn't actually uh, uh, measure them in, in in detail, 
So that work still needs to be done. But he did some really interesting geochemistry, and he's a chemist by training. But the paleosols themselves, he was looking at comparing them to what Retallick did. Retallick mapped them and measured them all out. And so Retallick sort of grouped them into, into two sort of type paleosols. And one was the Potter's Mills paleosol, and the other was the Faust, the Faust flat paleosols, both at Potter's Mills. But Faust would be the bottom one there is a little more immature, so it's just an A and a C horizon. And whereas the Potter's Mills, a little bit more developed, there's some carbonate nodules in them. And so Ted was going out trying to find these paleosols or, or trying to identify all the paleosols he found and correlate them to, to what Retallick found to, you know, to see if they could replicate that and then do some geochemistry on, on what he found. Do, he did a little micromorphology too, so he made some thin sections because that's gonna tell us about these soils because the soils tell us that the landscape is stable, right? At, at least for a time for soil to start developing. Now the Faust flat paleosols, they're pretty immature. So it's not stable for a long time. It's, it's pretty poorly drained. And, and you know, you're probably sitting on, on sort of a more waterlogged environment. But you start getting a B horizon in the Potter's Mill paleosols. And we found some paleosols that were pretty developed. And so that's telling us, oh, this is a stable landscape. You know, th this isn't a landscape where you're necessarily seeing, you know, daily tidal action on top of it. You're not going to get a, a stable, mature soil on that. You, you're you're somewhere you're somewhere where there's some stability. And we found in the thin section, so the middle image there, that's that's a clay filled root trace. So that's telling us that the drainage that there is some drainage there. We're seeing some wetting and drying. So that's you know the the top image. It is sort of looking, uh, you know, old TVs where you would see static a little bit. But once you once you get your eye attuned to it, so the top image, the, these are all clay fabrics, and they tell us something about the water. The clay itself doesn't really tell us much. It's all the same. But you know, the you know, part of it is you have to account that the Juniata was buried four or five kilometers before it came back up. So there is some compaction that you have to uncompact this a little bit. It's been, the clays themselves have probably been, um, there's been a little illitization going on. But in any case, what, what Ted was trying to do was look at the soils that he could find at B horizon and do the geochemistry on them because, because you can use that geochemistry to start making inferences about uh, you can you can come up with weathering ratios that are proxies for for uh, paleo precipitation. So he 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 started coming up with uh, he he got estimates right around 1300. So you know semi humid, which you know sort of sort of fits a little bit with where we're at. We're you know 20 25 uh, 30 degrees south latitude. So we're in sort of the the subtropics. Retallics. Uh, uh, geochemistry. He redid his geochemistry in 2015. His earlier work didn't rely on geochemistry. It relied on depth to the carbonates, which is a little more uh, suspect. And so his earlier precipitation rates were, were a lot lower, but his redone precipitation rates different from, from what Ted found. And so there is a disconnect here on, on what exactly, but but we don't actually have access to, to which paleosols Retallick was measuring. And with Ted's work, uh, we're assuming it was all done from the B horizon. He sort of sampled this. He was, all, he was left to his own devices. And so I, th I think what needs to be done is, is there needs to be a better look at these paleosols to, to really come up with a, a, a much more robust. There's a story here, right? Uh, is what I tell myself in the mirror before every trip out here. There's something here, and we'll figure it out maybe. But the, I think the paleosols play a really large part of the story, and I'm not just saying that because my background is in paleosols. They they tell us something about the landscape, and they, they provide a lot of. They've been used as as a tool in many other studies. And so I think that there, there is something here. I think there needs to be tighter control even beyond these two studies on exactly 
what paleosols are where and, and sampling from the B horizon to get like tightly constrained sort of sort of data if we're going to use that data. We have we have uh, an enormous amount of data that we have not we've 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 just collected. Again, we have this ability as geologists to just board. And so, but we're out there and we're like, why aren't we collecting? And we've we've done geochemistry. Ted did it. Uh, Augusta did it. I, we there was another grad student who's at UConn now who did some. He looked at um, he did some SEM work on it, and he did some SEM work. I threw this. Can you tell? I threw this slide together like four hours ago. I was just like just throwing things on the slide, but he actually looked at one of the root traces and he drilled into the root trace, drilled into the matrix. The chemistry is different, and he looked at it under the SEM as well. It didn't necessarily find much, but he he started doing this and then kind of went off to get his PhD and forgot about it. Uh, but I'm actually going to see him at GSA, and so this is this has reinvigorated me. I'm going to get back on him and be like, we have to go back out. We've got to go. There's more to collect. But we have all of this data, and I think one of the the issues we're running into is how do we synthesize it all? What kind of story do we make from this, right? And and so more recently, we went out and we had a drone because one of the problems with Potter's Mills is that it's a beautiful outcrop, but most of it is 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 meters and meters in the air or above our heads at least. You know, the blue represents sort of what we can access from the roadway. And without doing things that are dangerous or would again get me yelled at by my wife, we needed a way to access all of this, all of this, look at all that beautiful rock. How do we get to it? Well, now we have drones. And so Steve Peterson, one of my other podcast co-hosts, is, is a certified drone pilot and he brought his drone out. This isn't a real life image. This is me making a PowerPoint at one in the morning losing my mind a bit. But we we have we've taken three surveys of this outcrop now. And you know, his drone gives us you know, these 48 megapixel images that allow us to start to see these beautiful features that are high up up close. And to the point where we can do some some we can take active measurements off of them. And so we can get much more detailed measured section of the entire outcrop and start piecing this story together. And one of the big things at, at my GSA talk is when when we, we we did our last drone survey last summer was we had this plan in place of, of what we were doing, you know, what information we had found for our abstract and whatnot. And it, it involved, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a second, what, what we were actually trying to accomplish. But after we took these photos, one of the things about the drone is that it has two cameras on it, right? One takes these images and the other is actually a thermal camera, which we didn't do anything with. But I remember when Steve uploaded all these images to our, our shared drive, uh, Chris Semenak, who's, who's now down in North Georgia, he called, he called up and he's like, hey, did you look at these images? And I was like, I sure did. Like, why wouldn't I? I'm trying, I'm giving a talk about it. I need to look at these images. He's like, no, did you look at the thermal images? I said, why would I ever look at those images? And he goes, because they show us so much detail. And I was like, what? And so here the thermal image, this was totally just by chance. The thermal imagery actually made a lot of the bedding sort of stand out. One of the problems here in the Juniata is that because it's so silty and there's so much, uh, you know, especially even in the in the sandier parts, there's silt, so it weathers out and it sort of breaks down and you kind of lose the bedding. It's really tough to trace. And so trying to make out, you know, where the bedding planes are, what bedding features we see is difficult. And that's part of the problem. You get up there and you put your face up to it and you start tracing things out and they sort of die off because they get covered. In, in just weathered material. And here the drone the drone allows us not only to step back and see the big picture, but the thermal imagery actually made some of these some of these images pop out. And Chris called up and he's like, look at the look at the thermal images. And I remember being like, oh, holy moly, look at those. And I go, those are channel cuts. He goes, those are channel cuts. And he's like, give me a few minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna trace these channel cuts out. 
And now he took like three days, but so I was, he said a few minutes, but turns out he's a liar. Uh, but he, he, he started tracing it out and we started seeing, uh, you know, the features here and we're like, oh shoot, th maybe this is more fluvially influenced than we thought. And you see evidence of fluvial channels, but one of the questions is trying to figure out, well, what type of channel, because this is the Ordovician, right? There's no life on land. There's no plants on land. You have like early bryophytes, little moss, and what, what they keep in the literature referring to as biologic crust, which I don't know what that means. So the landscape is, is, is sort of totally alien and totally foreign. And one of the things we have to do is sort of figure out, well, well what does a river on this foreign landscape look like? How do they behave? Is, is it, is it are, are, do you have meandering channels on this type of landscape? Is the biologic crust enough to stabilize or are these silty clay sediments on the banks enough to stabilize or is it everything gonna be more braided? And so trying to figure this out, but we see features that are distinctly, you know, channelized flow. And so it is, are these fluvial channels? Are they, you know, are we just looking at tidal channels? It is, it is one of the, one of the big questions here of, of what we're, what we're trying to piece together. And then within all of that, so we start seeing these large channels. We're like, I think those are channels. Those are real channels. This is a real fluvial system. And so we get back to this idea, which that fits in with how paleosols work, right? You're in the overbank, you know, the, the stable soil in between the channels. So you have this, this stable landscape. So it gets back to the earlier question about then what are these features? You know what are these traces of, and and it it is it is sort of the the question we're trying to trying to work at, and we're approaching it from trying to make sense of the depositional environment, right? We're approaching this from well, shoot, what is this landscape doing here? And you know, is it is it is it terrestrial? Is it marginal marine? Is it somewhere weirdly in the middle? And so our, the last thing we were doing was approaching it from the point of view of, all right, well, let's let's sort of think big picture. We're on the coastal plain. I don't think there's any sort of denying that, whether or not we're marginal marine or coastal plain terrestrial is, is sort of the question, because you go a little bit west and you're in the marine. Well, so if you're on the coastal plain, any sort of, base level changes should be recorded here. And so we've, I, we've done work elsewhere. I've, I've done work in the Cretaceous with this idea of looking at coastal plain, um, the influence of base level on, on coastal plain sediments, coastal plain paleosols, and, and approached it from what are called fluvial, sequen fluvial aggregation cycles, which is just this idea that, you know, as, base level changes uh, as sea level changes, it's going to affect your coastal plane. And you can look at the stacking pattern of these fluvial packages to try and start piecing together what your base level is doing. The way it sort of works is, you know, you're gonna have the, the, these periods of, of, of decreasing base level, so falling base level, is, is going to give you sort of a, a much more stable uh, uh, landscape. Um, and so you're gonna have more mature soils, sort of thinner fluvial packages, sorry, thicker fluvial packages with thinner channel sands, thicker soils. And then as your base level rises, you get much more flooding on the coastal plain. Alluvial systems as base level rises, and we see this, you know, throughout geologic time, you get much more flooding. As base level rises, your accommodation goes up. And so your, your, your packages become, uh, start to start, to, start to, to, to stack here. And you get much more aggradation um, within these systems. So we can look at the stacking pattern to try and piece together the story. And, and you know, it was just sort of, we we're just sort of applying it here. This is a, a first pass you know, trying to see, all right, do we see actual packages? And it's one of the things you see at the Juniata 
where you have this this alternating sand and 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 silt in this case you know especially in the upper portion distinctly paleosol which would be we're going to call overbank it's just because that's on the floodplain as soon as you dump that overbank it starts to undergo pedogenesis and so we look at these packages and we start to see oh shoot you know we we see these packages both both in the the you know down section and up section you know because the the outcrop goes around to bend and we're thinking about how it how it's you know it, it's sort of it's, it's sub horizontal in the up section and the, then it becomes a little bit more more tilted in the down section and so we tried to measure out all of it and figure out what the stacking is doing here and you see these distinct packages that, that pop out and so you take all of this data and you, you try and look at the how they how they align to try and see if you can see any trends because the way it should work right is that as your base level rises and falls you should see your your packages thin and then thicken and then thin as base level goes up and down and you look for those changes as as sea level is changing as it influences base level and this is what they they look at from down section to up section the thickness plotted out and everywhere you see an inflection between thinning to thickening as they start getting thicker your accommodation is going up they're they're grading more and so that's going to tell us that base level is rising and everywhere it goes from thickening to thinning, base levels falling. And we see what appears to be cycles within this. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to, to piece this story together. And this is, you know, these cycles in the Juniad have been seen elsewhere, right? If you go to Virginia and West Virginia, there's been some work, Linda Hinoff down at George Mason has tried to equate some, some Milankovitch stuff onto the Juniata, but, but there's been some, some some cyclic packages down there as well. Um, so it, it is something that's that's sort of interesting. One of the things we, we want to do is is start to try and look at these in context now. All right, you know, if if your base level is rising, does that make sense with the actual sedimentology that we see? You know, do we see evidence of of it being um, um, you know reduced or, or glade, you know? Or if your base level is falling and it's much more exposed, is it more stable? Do we see that within, say, you know, the 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 paleosols uh, that we find there? And you know, this is this is work to be work to be done here. It, it, a lot of it is, you know, when we think about the the whole picture here, it, it's tying all of this together. You know taking all of these individual little studies and trying to synthesize it into sort of a bigger picture. The drone has really helped us sort of step back. These, we are on the side of 322 here and it's it's a highway and it's coming up the hill. So everyone's getting speed and, you know, God forbid you're there on a football Saturday, everyone's blowing their horns at you. And so, you know, you're, you're close to, it's wide me, it's a wide shoulder, but still shoot. You, you, you know, you're getting your face. So the drone allows us to really step back, you know, virtually without worrying about, you know, getting distracted and stepping onto the roadway. But it has given us this big picture view to sort of think about this, um, you know, from a from a wide angle point of view. Now, um, you know, the the last sort of thing here. Uh, I'll, I'll end and I'll shoot. I, I, I went through this really quick, uh, which is good for you. Um, it's sort of this big picture idea, right? Is, is, is where we're at. And one of the things, one of the takeaways, especially from this, this last segment we did in the fall, is that sometimes I think we get too caught up in, in trying to define these things uniformly. All right, the, the Juniata is marginal marine and it's marginal marine and it's marginal marine no matter where you're at. Whereas you look at coastlines and coastlines do not behave like that. So, so what is to say we're not, you know, coastlines undulate. And, and so what's, what's to say we're not in one of these undulations where you just, you have, you, you're, you're dominated, you're getting the same shed, sediment shedding off into the foreland, but you're on just a more stable landscape. So you're getting some soils and whatnot that are forming. You're on, on this little, you know, this little section of, of the coast, 
which, you know, I, I, I'm not going to wade into whether or not these are real terrestrial millipedes. I'm not, not looking for that kind of glory here. This is just an idea. But, you know, I, I think there is, I don't dismiss it out of hand just because you've never seen it elsewhere. Shoot, just last week, Gilboa got dethroned, right? As the oldest trees on earth. It got pushed back 5 million years now. So it happens, but I, I'm, I'm not certainly going to stand up here and say these are the oldest millipedes. I'm just saying that we're starting to see, I, you know, I go back and forth every time and I'm like, oh, I think these might be rivers. I think we might, might be on a, a, a more stable landscape than we think. But I think there's work to be done. One of the problems that you may have recognized is that, you know, this encompasses, I don't know, eight years of work or something. I don't want to think about time like that. But it's all the same outcrop. Shoot, I need to get out more. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've, I've looked at other outcrops. I've gone down to Wagoner's Gap and Jack's Mountain, some of these other Juniot outcrops in, in our little neck of the woods here. And, you know, I, just none are as nice as Potter's Mills. It's, it's, it's not as easy. Uh, but but I think trying to, to start to think tie together, especially nearby, would give us a, a much better picture. Really trying to create a more comprehensive image, you know, it, it is it's it's fascinating just because it's a question, right? Where are we at and what's happening? And that's sort of I guess maybe the heart of of geology here is just trying to figure out what it all means. So I I don't. We don't have any answers and it kind of just ends very abruptly with saying like well you know if you're driving up 322 in june or july you'll probably see me so feel free to stop by uh even even though last summer i said to myself i need to take a break from this i just need to move on but no i can't i need to i need to go back so anyway i'm, I'm just gonna end there and end fairly abruptly end a little early um but I, I do appreciate you sort of listening to me. This has been more cathartic. This is just for me to get this off my chest. Uh, but give you give you a little insight of, of what we're doing, and and maybe what we're trying to trying to to figure out out here. So anyhow, I, I, I thank you for my your time. We've got plenty of time for questions. So. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, widen it out here. Okay, yeah, there's a. Okay, so yeah, question here: Any siderite found in the paleosols? No, and so that that's an interesting. So I, the siderite's a really interesting little mineral, right? It's an iron carbonate, and and you uh, you can do isotopic work on on siderite. I, I did some in the Cretaceous on the coastal plain in New Jersey and Delaware, uh, but you don't find any here. And one of the things Retallick said he found in in the burrows was the, the, they were ferruginous, you know, they're iron. And I, but I didn't see any of that. So it is interesting when you you know you start looking at others' works and you're like, where did you find that? Where you? But no, the, I guess the quick answer is no, no siderite. Yeah, but did you mention about the the chemistry being used within the heat horizon of daily salts to help oh, estate precipitation? Is that correct? Yeah, if you do the chemical uh, index of alteration minus potash is sort of the go-to. Why the ratio is where you not square with that method? Is you just spend a minute just saying how does that work? Yeah, so you, you look at um. Oh, uh, no, it's fine. I can just, I'll sort of wing it here. So you, you look at um, basically uh, your, your uh, let me see here, your bases, your sort of the, your, your base elements. So, um, and you're looking at things that are getting leached out versus things that don't leach out, the ratio. Um, the more rain and precipitation, you would expect things to, to leach out. So like um, aluminum and magnesium and calcium. Um, Shoot, I wish I. It's like a qualitative. Can you actually quantify? You can quantify, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's the, the ratio is quantified. That's how we come up. With, Ted came up with his number. Retallick came up with his number of you know thirteen, you know whether or not it's actually thirteen hundred and forty six 
plus or minus, whatever. But it does give you there. It has been, you know, uh, used pretty successfully successfully uh, in a lot of places. And it's a pretty pretty standard approach. Yeah, I, whether or not it works in the order of vision is, is sort of a question. Um, but we applied it here, and it, you know, it, it sort of makes sense. But it is, you know, it, it is one of those things where part of it is like, you know, th these soils have been squished and they've been buried and they've been, you know, brought back up, and the the chemistry's been, you know, they've <clears throat> undergone some things. They've seen some things, I guess we should put it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Your, your symbols with the little red triangles, were those to, to uh, illustrate finding? Yeah, finding upwards. Upward? Yeah, finding upwards. Because you had a lot of them, they were coarsening upwards or finding upwards. They were. Uh, they, uh, those, those are finding upwards. Yeah. Okay. And you had another one, I guess it was around the bend. Yeah, start. these guys, these are finding upward as well. Okay. That's how that's how you at least how you consider these these okay. packages. Yeah. The the channel and the overbank on top of it. I guess some questions online. Um, so the changes in base level to what they were seeing mean sea level. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, base level and and we're experienced like right we're at the point where we're going into an ice house and then right at the end you come out of the ice house. There's this fluctuation. And the Ordovician ice house was was sort of a big one. Well, Gondwana's down over the South Pole and it you know, the lower end of the Ordovician ice house ice mass was was probably a little bit greater than the the last glacial maxima. So and that's the low end of it. So uh, uh, thinking about sort of how much base level changed it, probably pretty significant. So was the Juniata being deposited when the ice was coming and going down there? It's, well, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, it's probably- That was about the time. It's probably at the, it's, it's probably at the tail end when things, it's as we're coming out of it, because right above the Juniata is the, is the Tuscarora, which is Silurian. Yeah. And we're out of it. We're into the hot house by the Silurian. There's some debate on how quickly the ice house ended, okay. which I don't know. You're talking to the wrong guy about that. What was yes. the, the time duration of that late Silurian ice house period? So the the late late Ordovician, you come out of it by um, yeah, put it in this. Several. Several million years. Or? Yeah, I think as as the best the ice sheet. Yeah, several million years here. So yeah, you're in. It's it's mostly in the, the Renaissance stage here. Um, but you go into it. So it's you know you can see onset of the cooling. Whether or not you know you start getting your ice sheets there is is, is sort of a question. But but you see it come in. Especially at the beginning of the Hernation at 4:45, and then you're you're out of it in the Silurian at 4:43. So you know, two years, three years, three two years, three years, two three million years. What's a few million years? Thanks, friends. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you want to take that one so I don't have to read it? I don't. Any evidence of distal pyrolasts? In the upper Juniata from 432.6 million years, olivine melilite? Mel uh, you can tell how well I did in mineralogy. Um, I, I do clay. <laughs> um, uh, from sub Schwagung Nephilim. I have I I don't have an answer for this. If, as you as I struggle through these words, <laughs> you can tell. Yeah, I don't. Sorry, if it's not, yeah, if it's not smectite or illite or kaolinite, I'm out. Uh, otherwise, it's just quartz. Uh, is the base of the Juniata exposed? 
and any similar paleo environmental exposure in the underlying unit. Right. So the the so the bald eagle. This might be a better question for this host. Did, you guys thought you found the contact of the Juniata and the bald eagle, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, you under the overpass, yeah. So we found the exposure, but I don't think we ever did anything about it. Noted it to go back. I don't know much about the paleo environmental exposure, or I don't know much about the paleo environmental about the the bald eagle. I, um, you know, I I, I can say the. You know, I can I can give you the just you know tell you about the bald eagle, what it's made of. You know, coarse grain cross bedded sandstones, the 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 lost run member, which is a conglomerate that you see pulse in, and which is really interesting. Maybe we should look at that. Maybe that's where we'll go next. It was just abandoned. This no good geology projects ever finished. They're just abandoned. Uh, <clears throat> What role do microbes play in soil development and where evolutionary wise were they at in the Ordovician? So um, microbes, so, you know, we're starting to get, as far as I can tell, you, you start to get, um, from what I've read, I'm not a biologist or, or a microbiologist, from, from what I can tell, you know, microbes play a role in soil and in soil chemistry for sure. I, I don't have much insight into how the how they might affect the Ordovician soils, um, but you're you're having like like we said you you get sort of these biologic crusts, which there's some thought that they're just different sort of algaes creating these crusts, um, or these bryophytes. So like sort of like these. There's some thought you have what are called um, cryptospores as well. So sort of like the very earliest spore bearers. But you get a lot of you know moss-like or lichen-like stuff. So it, it kind of creates a crust. It might create stability there as well. Um, but anything beyond that, I'm sort of just talking out. Yes. Well, that sort of brings to mind that something that's puzzled me a little bit. I seem to recall you mentioning that you observed what you considered to be build root channels. What would be forming a root channel at that point? Yeah, so that's 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's part of the so the the early so the 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 mossy bryophyte things you get the little wispy traces that come down and you see them you know through time you see them in the modern but then they get filled in with secondary clay. Um, yeah, exactly. Good question. Well, it's 7.30. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, it is, this is perfect. Well, that, that started with another completely different question is, why don't you simply rent a whole truck and slow down the lines on 222? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I borrow your credit card? <laughs> yeah, I'll put it in your name as well <laughs> when I tell PennDOT. <laughs> yeah. Well, so one of Chris Semenak, one of the, the guys who works on this with us, is a, is a rock climber. And he, every time he's like, I'm just going to bring my harness. I'm going to get up on top. I'm going to rappel down. I just need you to, you know, hold me. And I was like, I don't, you have a wife, you have a child. I don't want that on my conscience. <laughs> Uh, but he he has been claiming for years he's gonna rappel down and and look at the upper stuff there. So if he wants to, he can. How oh, high? Uh shoot, fifty meter. What do we say? It's thirty meters. So sure. you, yeah, high enough that it, I don't want to go up there. Yeah. I think it might be interesting to consider flying drone with lidar. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about that for a while, and uh, you know, I I think that would be yeah, that's been on no pun intended on my radar to to yeah, you could really see some of the bedding planes, pretty great. Who owns the property? Have you ever had any problem with 
being, you know, accessing it it's like the state police ever stopped you or no, no one, not once. And we've been, yeah, for years and years now we've been out there and no one's even stopped. The, the state police will just wave. And I, 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 the it's private property above. That's part of the reason I think we've never gone. That's what I tell myself. We've never gone up top. But yeah, we've, and there's, there's a campground right there at the base and we stayed in the campground and just walked up and they've, there's never the highway right away. That's right. Yeah, I think yeah, and it's yeah, it's just a state highway. So yeah. it's a big enough shoulder, and it's in a little culvert. That I mean, we even park our trucks, and we're so far. There's a turning lane coming out of Sand Mountain. Is the little road there? So there's a whole turning merging lane. So we're not even in the traffic. There's a whole lane that separates. So yeah. Yeah. Traffic yeah. I. I I made it more dramatic than it sounded. <laughs> it's just trying to make it sound dangerous. Uh, but yeah, we've, yeah, we've never, never had any problems. Once had to work around a dead deer, but otherwise, <laughs> which, yeah, the, the smell hits you first before you see what it is. Yeah. Final question. Yes. If you would jump into molten lava, <laughs> what would happen? You would, you would sink a little bit, but not completely. You would die. <laughs> Their last uh, or, or a side tangent conversation. Yeah. Their last podcast. It it has density, so you <laughs> wouldn't say. All right, let's thank this again. Remind us where we can. Reminder: If you're here, sign in. Um, and look, we need more speakers for next season. And you know, I'm resorting to violence, so that's, that's how we got Jesse here. So please, if there's someone you're interested in, a topic you're interested in. Left to my own devices, I'm going to get sedimentologists and stratigraphers in because that's what we got next month. So if you want some some variety, bring in some speakers. Uh, also, for those of you here, we have some new giveaways. There are second survey publications that we're giving away. So take a look before you leave. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks. Thanks.